Today on C-Level, Jonathan Page, Chief Legal Officer of Imprime Legal. We talk about being an entrepreneur and the journey and struggles to success. Hey, so, so I mean, we've known each other for a few years now yeah. and been working together. And, and so, um, for, for the people that don't know, like, just give me a background, you know, how did you start? How did you get into the business? I know, I know. I know a little bit of the entrepreneurial side. We'll get into that, but yeah. Tell me a little about. So, my grandfather, right, mm -hmm. had uh, had an entrepreneurial bug, mm -hmm. like a lot of us do. Right. And he decided to open a, a pulpwood company called Tatum and Page Pulpwood Company, mm -hmm. and it was in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, mm -hmm. back in the 1950s. And he was really charismatic. He was a community guy. People loved him. He was good at sales, and he loved running the crews. And so the, the business sort of exploded, mm -hmm. and he, they were doing really well, and he purchased a private airplane. He had, like, an, uh, you know, an uh, old 88. Yeah, all right. Um, he bought an Amoco filling station, and yeah. I mean, he had all these cool things. Yeah. And my dad was probably in fourth, fifth grade, and, you know, my grandfather sort of didn't like the finance side of things. Um, he didn't like the expense side. He just didn't want to keep track of that. So they got this finance guy to join the company. Mm -hmm. And the finance guy would tell my grandfather, you know, every day that the books were good, right? Mm -hmm. And my grandfather felt like they were good because he was out there selling. Right. And he saw the jobs coming in. Right. But in reality, this finance guy was embezzling all the money, arguably. In my grandfather's eyes, it was embezzlement, but regardless, the money was all gone. And so, Jeez. you know, my dad, um, what he remembers next is coming home from fourth grade rounding the barn door and seeing a single pulp wood truck backed up to the home with furniture in every single direction. Mm -hmm. And he walked up to the house, not knowing what was going on. My, my grandmother was out there. He said, what, what, what's happening? I've got these school books. Yeah. She said, we're leaving. Wow. So he walked in to try to get his fishing rod, his other toys. My grandfather had sold everything mm -hmm. in order to get enough cash to move the family that night. And they were making Georgia by midnight. Wow. I mean, this was a time where you file bankruptcy and you don't show back up to the same community that you're right, in. Right, right, right. And so that story sort of stuck with me. It stuck with my dad. And I was thinking about it. It's, it's been something I've sort of struggled with. My dad has now scaled two successful businesses. Mm -hmm. So I kind of grew up in that entrepreneurial family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a part of me that said, man, you know, my, my grandfather, he just got a bad rap. Man, he just got unlucky. Right? Because right. he never grew another business again. Mm. He felt like a failure. Mm. And as I kind of grew as an entrepreneur myself, what I realized is that it was my grandfather, really, who had the problem. It wasn't the finance guy. Mm. How so? He had the problem because he became a victim. Mm. And once you're a victim, once you are blaming somebody else or something else for something that has happened in your life, as soon as you assign that blame, right. you are now the victim. Right. And that means you're powerless. Right. Because whoever you are blaming or whatever you are blaming has more power over you now than you do. Right. Because you can't do anything right. about it. They're the reason I'm not successful. Interesting. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. I mean, and, and I think... Those types of things, especially with entrepreneurs, they're, they're always, you, you, as an entrepreneur, risk is your life. Mm -hmm. And if you can't go out and take this risk knowing that, hey, something could happen, if, you, if something does happen and you stop, you're lost. You just, you gotta, you gotta rise like a phoenix, you know? That's what I always talk about. It's like, you know, things are gonna happen, you know? But long as you, long as you don't let that one event stop you from your ultimate goal, you're gonna continue on the right path, so. But yeah, I see, I see exactly what well, you're Well, so I started studying other entrepreneurs because yeah. I got curious, yeah. you know, what is it to be an entrepreneur, right? right. I right. mean, is it all this rosy road and just they lay out, you know, the red carpet's laid right. out yeah. and it's just an easy ride. Nope. And as I started to dig into some of these stories, it was the same story my grandfather went through. There was this guy back in, I think it was like 19, 1920s. Yeah. He did what everyone else did. When you have an innovative idea, mm -hmm. he opened his own business. Right. 30 days, he failed. Mm -hmm. He went back at it, but now he raised $15,000 of other people's money, mm -hmm. which is like half a million a day. Right. And had some success, didn't pay his debts, 
filed for bankruptcy Ugh. and he, he's out of business. Yeah. So what did he do? He started the business again, hired back some of the same people, had some initial success, mm -hmm. and then he signed a contract that licensed the innovation that he had developed over to a competitor, didn't realize what he was signing, oh, wow. and found out afterwards that he had no rights to his innovation anymore. <laughs> and everything he was working towards was gone. Wow. So what did he do? Start again. He started again. <laughs> and then the Great Depression hit. Oh, um, wow. So every step of the way, he had every reason to be a victim, mm -hmm. and he had every reason to stop. Right. But he didn't. Yeah. Why didn't he? Right. Because he had this relentlessness around the vision that he had set out. Mm -hmm. He was going to be relentless about achieving that vision. And I'm sure there were moments where he felt like a victim, mm -hmm. but he had to talk, and I'm sure he talked himself through it and said, I can't be the victim. I've got to take the power right. back. Right. And I've got to move forward. Right. So when, during the Great Depression, he finally sold a product that generated $1.5 million in sales. Wow. 1.5 million yeah. in the Great Depression. Wow. Do you have any idea who this is? Give it to me. Walt Disney. There you go. And Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was the movie that he had sold mm -hmm. for one that distributed and generated $1.5 million in sales. Right. And with Snow White, that was the first feature-length animated film. No one had done a full feature-length animated film. Everybody, his brother, who was his right-hand man, mm -hmm. Roy, mm -hmm. his friends, his colleagues, all told him, don't do a feature-length oh, yeah. animated film. That yep. is the dumbest thing you can do. Right. You've had all these failures, right. and now you want to go and do a feature-length animated film. Right. Had he not done that film, we wouldn't know Walt Disney. Exactly. And, and, that, and that's the thing, too. He, he, he never gave up, but as a visionary, sometimes, you know, y you see it completed. You know, and I think that's, you know, there's some entrepreneurs that are visionaries, and, and like in the case with Walt Disney, you know, he's a visionary. He saw it completed. He said, no, this will work. I, I can see it, whereas a lot of people... They're day to day, and they just they, they don't they don't see that, and and because of the experiences that he had before, just strengthened him. And failure for for Walt Disney wasn't an option. And and I think I think when when those things align to where you know you, you have zero f you, you you can't have any fear that's mm -hmm. out the window. Like if you have a lot of fear, you don't become an entrepreneur, right? So that's out the window. And then staying, staying true to your vision, staying true to yourself. If you have, if you, if you crystal, if you see something crystal clear, and you're not willing to give up, you're going to obtain, you're go, or you're going to learn to to your next venture, right? So the first couple of ones not so great, but that prepared him for what was to come, and that was that was Disney. You know, like like one of the biggest things I think that that businesses you know fail is when they say it's always been been done this way, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this is this is just the way we always do it. And if you if you're not always under construction, right, and you're not ready to innovate to whatever that next thing is, you're gonna fail. So, talk to me about like what do you think about how important it is about you know businesses innovating and coming up with new ideas and new strategies, maybe like what you did with with the law firm here. Yeah. So I think. I'd like to start at the core, yeah. what I would consider the core. So there's a series of books. I, um, one of them was written in 1897. Mm -hmm. And this book, Henry Ford, is on record saying that he attributes all of his financial and business success to the ideas in this book. And it's called In Tune with the Infinite. It was written by Ralph Waldo Trine. Mm -hmm. And in this book, they t he talks about what's called the infinite spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And basically the same concept. If you can think it, you can create it. You can create whatever it is that you desire in your life. And then there's some, a series of books that came after that, one of which was Think and Grow Rich, that yep. all sort of built on these concepts. Yep. Um, and one of them was called The Science of Getting Rich. And by the way, rich in that book is simply having everything that you need in life to live the life that you want to live, right? That's what rich is. Right. I mean, when you say rich, it, it resonates different with different people, people, just yep. that word, right? right. Um, and so The Science of Getting Rich was trying to build that sort of life. And in that, he talks about this sort of tangible substance that's out there, mm -hmm. right? And it's an abundance mindset. Mm -hmm. And the idea of it is that there is this, there is this wealth, this abundance of, of money. Mm -hmm. There's an abundance of creativity. There's an abundance of innovation. Yep. And we just haven't thought of it. Right. So when we're, when we're in the bloody ocean, so to speak, mm -hmm. and competing with other people mm -hmm. for a particular service or product, when you, innovation is simply figuring out how can I do another iteration of this that creates a new marketplace, yep. right? So if you think about Uber, regardless of what you think about them today, right. 
when Uber went into the market, they were doing nothing different at its core than a taxi service. Right. It was a stranger. A taxi service that owned no cars. Right. <laughs> it's a stranger picking right. you up. Right. 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 In a car that's not yours. Right. Taking you from A to B. Right. And that's it. So the taxi service at that time was about two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. That was the market share. Right. Right. Uber comes into the market, and they didn't say, "I'm going to go after that market share." I want to go after the customers who are consuming taxi services. Right. I want to create what I would say is a blue ocean, mm -hmm. a new market space of different people. Right. So what they did is they took the same core utility and they innovated a new experience for the customer. Mm -hmm. They said, well, what if you could get this on an app? Mm -hmm. What if you could get ratings on the driver, which actually came later? Mm. What if I could you know, know exactly when they're going to pick me up, mm -hmm. right? right? They created they innovated a new way of experiencing a core utility. And by doing that, they opened up an entirely new market space. Right. There's consumers, I mean, I would have never used a taxi service. Mm -hmm. I use Ubers all the time. Right. 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 So they created new consumers, new customers who mm -hmm. would have never even thought of using a taxi service previously. Mm -hmm. And now the ride sharing space, which is this new market they came out, now it's a bloody Mm -hmm. Ocean, right, right, right. Yeah, Lyft and all the others. And all, yeah. But at the time when Uber first yep. entered, they were the only player. Right. They were eight billion. Right. Eight billion means that there's six billion other mm -hmm. dollars that are coming from people who never used taxi services before. Right. So it's just that I think that's what innovation. It's critical, and innovation is what tap allows you to tap into this sort of intangible space, this space that's just. I mean, just think about it. If if you were born in 1850, and I said you know, Chris, you can get on your phone, okay? Mm -hmm. You can get a picture of somebody in China yeah. in real time, yeah. right? And they wouldn't even know what no. a phone is. Right, they wouldn't know what a phone is. You can get on this box, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. it's gonna show you a picture of somebody who is across the world, right. and you're gonna see them move yeah. in real time, yeah. like within seconds, right. and you can talk to them, mm -hmm. and they'll be able to respond. Right. You From another like, world, yeah. You'd be like, that's yeah. not possible. Possible, yeah, exactly. Right. But it took somebody to have the innovative mind to actually see that that is possible, and have that relentless approach to actually make that happen. Right. And and it's like it's it's true. Like even like new things. That's why like I'm always open to ideas. Like I'm an, I'm naturally an ideas guy, right? So I don't think anything is impossible. I what I do is I have the 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 um, completed whatever it is like business idea or venture whatever app whatever it is the complete idea and then I see all right let me put a path to it. Does does the structure equal the end product. It, where, where, are the, where are the potential pitfalls? You're not going to see them all. You're, 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 you just mm -hmm. try to mitigate all of them, or, or as many as you can. You can't mitigate all of them. And then if that matches up, I know to, I know to go after that. Mm -hmm. I know it makes sense, right? So yeah, I mean, it's those things, people thinking outside the box, you know, and, and it, it just changes the world. It takes out one person. Lights, lights even. Yeah. You know? I mean... Well, with Edison. Edison. How many times did he fail? Like, almost a thousand. So they, ta they talk <laughs> like, about that, know? but what I think is even more crazy, yeah. he, he develops the light bulb, and there's no, like, wired electricity. Right. No. Like, he's got something, yeah. and, like, yeah. how is he going to make do, it work, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. certainly, how's everybody going to get this in their house? I mean, right. he was creating something that they didn't even have the infrastructure in place to, yeah. to make it, you know, useful at the right. time. So that's how visionary he was. I mean, right. he was thinking, you know, years beyond. Right. So. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Impossible, in my opinion, is just an opinion. Yeah. That is all it is. It's yeah. an opinion. Right. 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 And it's a story that people people tell themselves to keep keep themselves safe. Yeah. It's so much easier. It's really being a victim. Mm -hmm. If you say something's impossible, right, what you're saying is that you can't achieve it and nobody else can achieve it. Mm -hmm. And so you're giving over that power to whatever it is you think is impossible. Right. You already lost. You've lost. Done. Yeah. There's no no <laughs> I mean, you, you stopped yourself. And, and I think, and, and another thing too, it's a mindset, right? So you talked about um, like this, this red ocean, blue ocean, right? So when people have, like say they're sitting in a red ocean, right? And they're like, man, I got so much competition, you know, they got more money that they can spend in advertising, blah, 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 making all these excuses, all these other things, you know, and it's like constantly, I'll never be a million dollar company. Or the, 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 the biggest one that I love is like, I gotta drive around 10 hours to find the cheapest gas, right? Yeah. It's a mindset. Yeah. And I believe that if you 
if you fixate your mind on what it, what you can achieve, right? Not not in the pre not. I mean, yeah, you may be you may be make you know paycheck to paycheck right now. But if you believe that that's what life is, you're going to be stuck there. Absolutely. Because you're not you're not even thinking outside the box. You're not even thinking what's possible. You're thinking this is the way it is. And I think one of the biggest things too is that it that that type of mentality also gets handed down. You know, and it's 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 tough. You know, but there's success stories. You know, there's people that have come from nothing, but yet automatically get outside of that rut mm -hmm. because they were willing to change their mind and and see what could be and then go after it and and not have any fear and not let anything come in their way. They'll figure out a way to 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 continue to move towards their goal. I think they also whether they would articulate it this way or not. But when you hear those success stories, I think what they ultimately understood was cause and effect. Mm. This is a universal law, right. cause and effect. Right. Every cause leads to an effect and every effect has a cause, mm -hmm. right? And so they looked at their own lives and the crappy situation they were in mm. and they said, this is what's causing it, yeah. right? And if I continue to do the same thing, I'm gonna get the same results. Right. So then they looked beyond their world Right, looked beyond their story that they were perpetuating, that their family, their father, their mother, their brother, their sister, the people they were hanging out with, right, who were all in this crappy situation right. with them, were all perpetuating. They right. looked beyond it and they started looking at other people right. who were successful. Right. And they said, what is it that they're doing? They must be doing something different, right, mm -hmm. in order to get a different result. Yep. And so let me figure out what they're doing. And they got into a, a a mindset of I am going to be successful. I used to uh, I used to have like the vision of the Paramount lot, the Paramount lot, and walking you know walking through the gates and stuff like that when I was a kid. And you know obviously I was I was a dreamer when I was a kid, but I always I always remembered that. And I actually you know through my career I did experience that. And I actually have the picture right before I step foot on the lot, which is which is really cool to have um, to, you know to finally see the success of that you know and see well man when I was a kid I was I was you know, had this image in my mind. Now it's like real. It's in front of me. I'm walking on the lot to go do a project. You know, and um, it's it's really cool to see those wins. But let's talk about that. Like wins and losses. Like I think um, you know the wins are great. You know, in my personal opinion, everybody loves wins. But if you look at losses as learning opportunities, like I always say, there's winning and then there's learning. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I think those might strengthen you more. You know, then, then if you just had tremendous success all your life and you didn't know what setbacks were. Yeah. yeah. So if this glass right here is today, mm -hmm. everything that's happened before today is gone. Right. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you say when you say loss, you're always thinking about something that's already happened. Mm -hmm. Right. There is nothing now you can do about it. Right. You cannot go back in time and change that. Right. So what most people do is they feel shame. Right they feel disappointment, they start beating themselves up, they get depressed mm -hmm. over something that doesn't exist. Right. Same with stress and worry, worry. That again, that's the, that's the expectation of yeah. something bad happening. Right. That doesn't exist. Now Mindset. they're looking into the future. Right. Right. But if you look back and say, I can't change this, but I can learn from it, mm -hmm. right? I can one, figure out what caused this to happen. Mm -hmm. What were the cause and effects that were at play that got me to that loss. Right. And what can I change to get new results in my life? Right. Right. And if they, if you, if people would just, and especially entrepreneurs, just think about every loss in that manner, mm -hmm. then they're gonna, they're gonna grow exponentially. Right. You know. Right. But you're right. Worries, worries, kind of the opposite spectrum. Yeah. It's, it's, and and there's there's a lot of books out there. This is what's crazy to me. There's a lot of books out there that talk about visualization. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'll talk to some other entrepreneurs and people who are trying to get in business and I'll say just exactly what we're talking about. You say, you know, you need to visualize what success looks like. Get really detailed about mm -hmm. it. Write it down and they're like, oh, that goofy stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. they kind of look at you funny or yeah. they listen to you but then they don't go back and do it. Right. 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 But yet you find them in a stressful situation and you analyze what's going on, mm -hmm. right? They're stressed out about something that hasn't happened. Right? right? It's the expectation of something happening. Right. And that's why they're stressed out. They're looking into the future and they believe right. that this really bad result is going to enter their life. Right. Now what are they doing? They're doing visualization. Mm. 
they are getting crystal clear on what that bad result looks like. Right. They can feel it, they can see it, yeah. they can smell it, yep. they can touch it, yep. they see every detail of it, yep. they see how their family's gonna look at them, right. they see the sad faces on their family, you know, right. on their family, right. they see like, it. them on the street, you know, begging yep. for food, whatever yep. it is, they're like getting so detailed about this bad result. Right. Yet they don't want to do the same thing, but ha uh, but for good results. Yeah. Like what actually success would look like in their life. Right. Right. Like take all that energy. Right. And do the exact, exact same thing. thing. <laughs> right. Right. For the good. For what you want. But what, it, what you <laughs> yeah. actually you want, want in life. Yes. Like what results yeah. you want to bring into your yeah. life. Yeah. The other thing is people get caught up on money. Yeah. And I I, I did. Mm -hmm. So I had this struggle with money. I was like, you know, I don't know if I want to be rich. I don't know if I want to drive a Bentley. Right. You know, I worry I'm going to be a bad person, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And again, this was all stories I was creating. And I see this in other entrepreneurs as well. And a lot of that stops them from being successful right. because it's almost like they want to sabotage themselves mm -hmm. because they're worried if they're a hundred million dollar company, they're going to have an affair with their secretary. Right. You know what right. I mean? Right. So they create these stories around money. But really, if you look at money, money in and of itself is just a symbol. If I had $50 million in my bank account and I never touched it mm -hmm. and I died and then that money got lost, that 50 million's meant nothing, right? right? So the money is simply an exchange mm -hmm. and it should be an exchange for value. Mm -hmm. So when I go buy something, right, it's because I've determined what it is I'm buying, whether that's a product or service, has some sort of value to me. Mm -hmm. And value, if I were to define it, is simply a service or product that improves your life in some way. Right. It adds to your life, it increases your life, that's what value is. Right. And if you think back to every purchasing decision, you went through a conversation in your head that this thing that I've purchased is going to improve my life in some way. Right. Even if it's a TV. Right. You right. know, it's going to allow me to watch movies and give me entertainment. Mm -hmm. You're making a decision to buy because it's going to increase the value. Now, if you've got a business, right? Mm -hmm that is marketing their services with integrity, what they're promising to the public is what they're going to deliver, right? right? Mm -hmm. And based on what they're promising, people see that it's going to increase their life. Mm -hmm. So they go and then buy that service or product from you and you get cash value. Right. And in exchange, they're getting use value from what they've purchased from you. Right. Why in the world would you not go out there and sell as much of your product or service exactly. as you couldn't? Right. Millions of dollars, if you're 50 million and you get to 100 million or even 200 million, that is a reflection of how many lives you've improved out right. there in the marketplace. Right. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. as, it's as noble as any charity. Yeah. Because you're going out there with a product or service that people can use mm -hmm. to increase their life. Mm -hmm. You and should sell as much of it as you can. And, and, and that's the biggest thing. I think, you know, people pay money for the value. And my big thing is I always, I always look to provide more value you know, like 10x the value of what's com what what I'm charging, right? So so this way, they always have it's it's always the the 5149, right? I always want to get 51 percent of the value as, as as so they always feel that they're winning, you know, mm -hmm. and they're always getting the better the better end of the deal. And and I think um, just you know my experience and one man's opinion is is like I, I like that model a lot better because um, a lot of times you know. You get you'll get repeat business that way. You get a lot of referrals that way, and I think when you're you're focused on providing the absolute best value you can, the money's going to come. Mm -hmm. Don't don't focus so much on the dollar per se of that's coming in. Focus on what value are you providing the client, whatever whoever whatever it is, right? And and if you do that, your money's going to be straight. You'll be fine. Yep. You know. I think you've got to focus on making sure it's valuable. Yep. And then you've got to focus on, from a business perspective, that you're actually delivering on the value promise. Right. Right. I think a lot of entrepreneurs take the eye off their ball. Mm. That's when their businesses don't do well. Right. They had a great concept. Yeah. They had a great service. They had a great product. Then it gets to the fulfillment stage mm -hmm. where they've actually got to fulfill those orders. Yeah. And they, you know, they're so focused on other things in their business that they don't have the right people in place. Right. They don't have the right machinery. What ends up getting produced isn't what they promised. Mm -hmm. And they start having to issue a lot of refunds. Yeah. And their business tanks. Right. You know, so I think as a CEO or as an entrepreneur or as a visionary, you know, it's you've got this creative mechanism at work that's creating this innovation, but you've got to ensure that either you or you've got the right team in yep. place to make sure that you're you were consistently and predictably delivering 
the value promised. See, now, and that goes into my next thing is that teams, right? So when building teams, especially being the CEO or the visionary or, you know, kind of planning this whole thing out, you need to know what your strengths and weaknesses are. Mm -hmm. Because if you know what your strengths are and you know what your weaknesses are and you're open about both, you're able to hire people with the strengths that, you know, are your weaknesses so you can start building that around. So if you are not a day-to-day -day person, go hire your day-to-day -day person. That's the only way you can scale. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you're more numbers driven as opposed to creative, you know, and that, and I think, I think building a team around you is, is not only going to be good for, for the business, but like you said, great for the client because you're going to be able to deliver on that promise. I mean, if you're a one man band and you're trying to do everything like account management and, and doing sales and doing that, you can only focus on so many things. Right. And I think young entrepreneurs, they fail to realize that they want to control everything because it's their baby. Yeah. But if you want to scale, I mean, lifestyle business is different. If you want a lifestyle business, that's fine. But if you're trying to scale, you, you got to let go of that control and put the trust in your people and surround yourself with those people that have those strengths in the areas you lack. Yeah, I think the best, uh, one of the strongest skills a CEO can have is talent acquisition. Mm, yes. Right? Yep. It's knowing who to get on the bus. Right. It's knowing who's going to be a rock star within their organization yep. and making sure that they're actually going out and getting those types of people. Yeah. But you're right. We all have the same 24 hours in a day, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And when you become an entrepreneur, nobody's like throwing an extra six. Right. You now got uh, 30 hours right, in your exactly. day, right? Yeah, you, that you would now be awesome. More, right? I'd love that. <laughs> I'd and wake he, up even earlier. <laughs> and here's the interesting thing. If you took like very successful CEOs who have multi-million dollar businesses that have been years in the business and you say, tell me what is your most important resource? A young entrepreneur oftentimes will think money, cash. That's the most important resource. But these CEOs will tell you time, right? Because what they realize is that's what, that's the only thing that's really finite in that's their it. life. Right. Is how much time they get in a day. Right. And so as you scale the business, you, because you're not going to get any more time, having a high performing rock star team in place, mm -hmm to help you fulfill is gonna be absolutely critical because you just can't do it, right. you know? Um, and, you know, so I think as a visionary, it's, I think the most important trait is having that relentless mindset. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing the visionary's gotta do is fire themselves from every job that they possibly can fire themselves. Yep. Because where their real brilliance is, is in that creative mechanism. Right. It's in the innovation. Right. It's in, you know, thinking into the future and how we can make these products and services better, right. how we can, you know, innovate some new delivery of a core utility that we're, we're providing. Right. And so that's where the visionary it needs to be left alone and have the freedom to do that. And if they're stuck in trying to do the technical work of the business, mm -hmm. you know, because they've got to fulfill orders, right. they've got to fulfill services. Yep. You're stunting your growth. You're stunting your growth. Yeah. You, you're, you don't have that freedom now. You don't. You don't have that that space right. to really be creative and do what you bring. You know what you bring the most to your organization, which is is that creative mechanism. Mm -hmm. And so, being absolutely relentless about your vision and what it is you want to bring into your life, I think, is the most important thing. And I would probably say the second most important skill is talent acquisition. Yes. It's being able to acquire the talent that you need to, to scale yeah. the business. Co co a company is people. It's made up of people. That's the word company means. Yeah. You know, and I think some people fail to realize that. And you, you know, and, and even like, so you know, I work in the movie business too, and it's like a set, a movie set, it, production is a company. It's a, it's a group of people. And I think, you know, because uh, I work as, as an EP, as an executive producer on a lot of projects, and when you work as an EP, you're, you're hiring, you're entrusting these people and you know you want to hire the best. You want to hire the best for for that role, for that job. You mm -hmm. know, and and it's no different in the re regular business world. Like you just identify who you need for that position, and then just hire the best talent because that's what it's about. From the top down, like in leadership, like if you're providing a framework, like for me, culture is huge. Like mm -hmm. culture is really really big in the in the in the company for us because you know if I. If I bring this certain type of culture to my employees and, and, and just the, the, you know, deploying empathy and, and, and a loving, caring environment and helping them grow and they're happy, that's going to trickle down to the clients because the clients are going to experience that because 
the employees are happy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you can tell the difference. Like when you, when you, when you, if you're ordering coffee at a, at a local coffee restaurant, whether they're happy at their job or not, you know, it's like, but it, it all stems from management. And I think, I think culture is a, is a big thing as well. You're right. Culture is absolutely critical as well. Um, and one of the things I realized, and this may sound a little, you know, I don't know how people would take this when I use this word, mm -hmm. but I think at the heart of a good culture is love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe that sounds wishy-washy, but if I were to define love in its true core sense, mm -hmm. love is simply wishing all the blessings for somebody else. Yep. It's wishing abundance for that person. Yep. It's wishing that they have, you know, the most fulfilling life possible. Right. And it's doing it under the understanding that they make their own choices. Right. You cannot will right. abundance onto somebody. Right. They've got to make the choices to bring abundance into their life. Right. But you certainly can wish that for them. Mm -hmm. And when you genuinely wish that for another person, that's love. Right. That's what the essence of love is. Right. And if you treat every single employee and every manager treats every single employee mm -hmm. that they're supervising that way, yep. you're gonna create a great culture. Right. Now you can sit there and create a procedure and say, we're gonna do this with birthday parties. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to go out to this activity right. every summer. Right. And they, you know, you got a culture department yep. and they do all these activities yep. and they're still a bad culture. Right, exactly. And really what was missing is is the core of it it's is that love, right? right? I, I agree with you. I think I think the love and, and the like truly caring for your employees, that's what's going to scale your business. Yeah. You know, because it's going to trickle down. You know, your employees, are, if they're client facing, they're going to love their clients. You know, and I, what I like to say is like, you guys, like my, you know, my employees, is you, you guys are a family. It's not like a family. You are a family. And our clients are an extended family. You know, it's, it, they're, they're part of that too. You know, it's like, and, and, that, and that's, it's just the way that I, I, I like to run business, and, and, I, and I've seen a lot of other successful entrepreneurs running their business that way. And, and again, it's not one person, it's a team. It's a team that does it. So if I were to put, like, what, what, what makes a team successful, mm -hmm. I would break it into two components. I would say, one, it's love. Mm -hmm. And it's having that true, like, genuine desire for the people that you're that that you're with the team that you're on that all the other team members have abundance and that they have a fulfilling life and actually wishing that for them right. right but the second component of it is for the supervisor or the business owner to be really clear about what the job entails mm -hmm. what's the expectation mm -hmm. they've got to be really clear about what it is that that position is supposed to perform what success looks like you know when you when you talk about a position I, there's two parts to that position. There's the activity, that's the job duties, that's what they're doing, you know, they're uh, putting a, a crew together, they're organizing this event, and then there's outcomes. Right. And the activity leads to those outcomes, right? right. And it's the outcomes that you're really after, yeah. right? We had a successful event. We sold all these new, you know, prospects and mm -hmm. they became clients. Right. It's these outcomes that you're looking at. And the more clear you can get on what outcomes you're expecting from the position, mm -hmm right, and give them an idea of what it is they're supposed to be do. So you make the expectations for that position crystal clear, then they're gonna know whether they're meeting those expectations or they're not. Right. And so sometimes love is letting somebody off the team. Right, yeah. Right, because they aren't doing the job well. Right. And as long as you were clear about what that job is, mm -hmm. they will move, remove themselves yeah, right. for the team. Exactly. Or when you have that conversation know. to bring them off yeah. the team, they're gonna know. They're gonna know. Yeah. So, so to change gears a little bit, so I'm going to talk a little bit about networking and, and you know, people talk about, you know, growing their business and, and uh, networking. How, how important do you feel uh, networking is for, for the growth of a business? So I would say a business has stages, right? Yeah. It's, and it's, it's in its infancy yeah. and then it kind of get in, gets into adolescence and then yeah. it becomes like a mature business. Right. And so when you're the CEO of sort of an infant business and even one where maybe you're well funded, mm -hmm. y you're sort of mindset is that of a hustler, right? right? I mean, your networking becomes critical. Right. You're out there, you're hustling, you're trying to get deals. As your business grows and it moves through adolescence and then maturity, you're hiring people to do that hustling for you. Right. Um, so I, and you're doing a different type of networking. Yep. I do believe that as a CEO, you're always gonna be networking. Mm -hmm. It's just, it becomes a different type of networking, right? right? You're now in groups where you're around other seven See. to nine figure business owners and maybe out of that, you'll end up doing some sort of joint venture, mm -hmm. you'll partner, mm -hmm. you'll figure out a way that y'all can create something even better oh out yeah. in the marketplace, which will result in 
new business coming in, new right. cash coming in, right. growing your business. So it's not that you don't, it's not that you stop networking, it's right. just that the networking becomes a different type of networking. Right. You know, at the beginning, uh, the networking is I'm going in here and, you know, how can I generate business? How, right. What is a good referral source for me? How can right. I develop a relationship with somebody who will, you know, refer us leads? Right. Or, or maybe there's somebody who actually could use our services in right. the group. I mean, that's kind of your mindset. Right. But I think as you, as your business gets more mature, you're looking for more of networking opportunities where you're networking to learn, yep. you're networking to build relationships with people who are in a similar phase of their business as you are, yep. and maybe you're networking to sort of create these joint ventures and create new opportunities. Right. So I think it just changes, but it's always a critical component of, of growing your business. And that what I say is like to young entrepreneurs in the beginning, just say yes. That's, that's all the words that come out of your mouth. If somebody says you, they, they want to invite you to a networking event or, or there's something, just say yes. Just you, you have nothing right now. You yeah. need to build something. So just say yes. Be a part of the, you know, whatever group it is. Start networking and starting meeting people, especially if you move to a new area or say, you know, you're starting a business in an area that you didn't grow up and you don't know anybody. The, the word yes is, is going gonna, is gonna to help you, um, you know, meet the right people to start your business. So uh, just to wrap up, so if there was one piece of advice that you would give a starting entrepreneur, what would that be? My advice would be get crystal clear on what your purpose is, what your primary aim is, what your vision for the future is, what your big audacious goal is. These are all really the same thing. Just get clear on what it is you want your life to look like and your business to look like five, ten years from now. Mm -hmm. And make sure that when you get clear on that, it's not wishful thinking. Right. right? And there's wishful thinking is just a it's, it's a myth, mm -hmm. right? It's only wishful thinking because you made it wishful thinking, right? right? But make sure you don't make it wishful thinking. Actually, it's gotta be something that you truly, truly desire, mm -hmm. that you truly want for yourself. Mm -hmm. Figure that out, mm -hmm. right? And then put behind it the expectation that those results will come into your life, right? right. And just get focused on being relentless about achieving that goal. If that's all you do as a beginning entrepreneur, I can 100% guarantee that you will be successful. Mm -hmm. I can sit here and give you a lot of tactics. I can talk about all the six working components of a, of a business. <laughs> right. We can get into some awesome marketing things. Those, those things, they exist already. Yeah. And your mind will find them. Right. You'll read them in an article. You'll meet somebody who will share that with you. But your mind won't find them if you don't have that mindset. The most important thing you can do is to get crystal clear about what it is you want in your life five or 10 years from now, mm -hmm. put the continuous expectation of you achieving that behind that, mm -hmm. think about it, dream about it, mm -hmm. write it down, mull over it, be relentless about bringing that into your life, have no doubt that it'll, it'll come in, have no fear behind it, have no victim mentality, and you're gonna be absolutely successful. Whatever the mind can conceive, you can achieve. Absolutely. <laughs> so. Go after it. Well, hey, man, I really appreciate yeah. you coming out. Thanks Absolutely. so much. Mm -hmm.